Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to um, this uh, service, or at least this message. Um, again, um, I'm thankful for our worship team, and of course, they have recorded some songs to help you with your worship this morning, and so I hope you have perhaps already uh, participated in that. It's online. You can find that, of course, there on our, our YouTube channel, uh, or go to our website, and um, and or to our Facebook page, and click on the the address there. So I uh, want to welcome you. Um, I do want to just begin by uh, saying that next Sunday, which is Sunday, February the 28th, we are uh, going to have an in-person service. It's going to happen at 1030. And so there's interest in that. There are people who say, yeah, they wouldn't uh, be um, be hesitant to, to come as long as we are following the, the protocols. And so we're going to try that, and that's next Sunday at 10.30. Uh, one thing I need to say to you is that uh, if you are planning on coming, you need to call the office or email the office and register. Everybody has to register, uh, register who's coming from, from your house. And we have a limit of 50 uh, people, uh, according to our uh, regulations in the orange phase here. And so uh, 50 people is the limit. If, however, we have more than 50, um, we're, we'll, we'll go to two services. We'll do one at 9 o'clock, perhaps, probably at 9, and then one at 10.30. And I'll let you know, uh, we'll let you know before that in terms of which one would be best for you to come to or, or that kind of thing. So be praying about that, and uh, next Sunday uh, we'll hope to see you here, and uh, we'll go from there after that. The other thing I want to mention is that this coming Tuesday, Tuesday the... Uh, the, um, at, at 7.30, uh, so that would be, I guess we're, anyway, wherever the date's going to be, uh, so Tuesday at, at, at 7.30 uh, in the evening, there's going to be a, um, an in, uh, not an in-person, uh, but a, an online um, gathering. Um, Deb, Deb McCluskey, uh, Debbie McCluskey is going to uh, be hosting a, a study kind of thing on making time for what, what matters. And that's going to take us, uh, take you up to Easter. It's a preparation for Easter. And, uh, information for that, uh, came out in the, uh, letter that was emailed to you on Friday, uh, as to how you can participate in that and get online with that. So I wanted to mention that to you and encourage you, uh, in that as well. So that's just a couple of things I wanted to say, uh, before we, um, before we start, uh, the message and, um, We'll go from there. So first of all, I want to read uh, the scriptures. We're going to look at Psalm 8 today, or at least start there. And I want to talk about, uh, I just want to encourage you, I guess, in terms of how how unique you are, how special you are. Uh, sometimes we need to hear that. We need to be reminded of that. In our day and age, we can, we can you know, get to thinking that we're not significant, we're not important. Um, and I think God says otherwise. And so I want to share some thoughts on that, but I want to start with Psalm 8, uh, then I, I will pray. Psalm 8 says this, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Uh, from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the, agent, the, the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You've put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and beasts of the field, birds of the air, the, the fish of the sea, and all that swim the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name, in all of the earth. This is the word of God, and we'll be looking uh, at that in a moment. But let's pray together, first of all. Lord, again, we uh, thank you for the privilege of um, bowing before you. Uh, we say, as the psalmist uh, says, that how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Uh, you are the one who is worthy of all glory and all honor and, and all praise for all things because all things are made by you, and all things consist in you. And all of the good that we have in this world uh, comes from you. Uh, our very life itself comes from you. And so we thank you for the privilege of living in this world that you've created and being your creatures. So gracious God, as we perhaps think about that today in, a, in, 
in, in ways that maybe we didn't think about it before. We ask that you would help us to be encouraged by your word, um, encouraged in these days that we live in today. So encourage us by your spirit and also speak to us. Uh, give us boldness to be your people in this world, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I'm going to start by saying that there's something I'm, I'm all, I've always been interested in. Um, actually, several things, but one of the things is is space. I've been interested in space. When I tell my wife that, she kind of jokingly says, well, yes, you're interested in that because you have a lot of it between your ears. But I'm interested in the universe out there and and uh, and and what's going on out there and, 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 you know, how far that goes. Right now, as a matter of fact, this week, uh, a lot of people's eyes, a lot of the world, uh, the eyes of the world are, are, are focused on Mars because I think there's three countries that have sent these missions to Mars and I think they've all arrived around the, around the same time. Uh, I love to look at, at, at pictures uh, from those, uh, the, that rover that is already there kind of thing of, of the landscape on Mars. It just kind of, it kind of fascinates me that that, that planet is so, so far, far away. And you we're seeing pictures of it, pictures of the landscape. And I just kind of, you know, I just, I just kind of wonder about that. I, I also like to look at the night sky. And maybe you do as well. I like to, on a, on a clear fall night, for example, to look up into the, into the sky and just uh, see the number of stars there and, the, and, and just the, the grandeur of it. And that's when I really wonder how big this is. That's when I wonder how far you know, that goes out there. And, and, and there are tremendous mind-boggling distances out there. And you know that as well as I do. I, I even am marveled, for example, by the, by the sun and the sunlight that hits our, our faces when it's a sunny day. That, that sunlight that hits our faces is old sunlight because it, it has traveled eight minutes, eight minutes from the sun. When it started from the sun, uh, it, it, it took it eight minutes to travel the, the 93 million miles from the sun to the earth, traveling at 186,000 miles per second, not miles per hour, 186,000 miles per second to get from the sun to, to shine upon your face. That kind of speed, that kind of reality, you know, just kind of boggles my mind. It takes that same sunlight, uh, 43 minutes to get to Jupiter, that same sunlight, seven hours to get to the planet Pluto. It's, it's, it's just kind of an amazing thought when you think about it. And, and that sun, um, it, it's one of some, uh, I think, 500 billion, I think that's right, 500 billion suns in, in this Milky Way galaxy that, that, uh, that we're a part of. And another one is the Antares star uh, out there. The Antares star is so big, it's so big that if, if, if our uh, galaxy, not our galaxy, but if our uh, solar system uh, were, inside, were, were, were near to it, or if it was where our sun is, then, then the earth would be inside of it. That's how, that's how big it is. And of course, as, as I said, the sun and, and, and that Antares star, two of some 500 billion stars in the Milky Way. The Milky Way itself, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's 120,000 or so light years from, from one end of it to the other. You know what the Milky Way looks like. You've seen uh, renditions of it. It's, it's that kind of like when you look down on top of it, it's kind of like a, a fried egg. It's got the, the yolk in the middle and then, you know, the, 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 the rest of the egg out, out around it kind of thing. If you look at it from the side, it's kind of like a quarter with a bump in the middle. Well, that Milky Way system that we're a part of is 120,000 or so uh, light years across from one end of it to the other. That's, that's a great distance. Uh, light uh, traveling at 186,000 miles per second travels 5.9 trillion miles in one year. Think of that, 5.9 trillion miles in one year. And so the, the, it, it, <laughs> that's the distance. And, and, and multiply that by 120,000. And you get the, you know, the, the, the breadth, if you will, of the Milky Way system. So there's all kinds of those. And there's, there, there's millions and millions and millions of galaxies out there. The nearest one to us is the uh, Andromeda galaxy. It's, it's some two uh, million light years away. Two million. You're able to, to catch sight of that, by the way, if you know where to look in the night sky, you can see the Andromeda galaxy out there. Well, that light that you're seeing has traveled uh, two million years to get to you. That light that you're seeing. So those kinds of things just, just amaze me. And I think somehow that the writer of Psalm, of, of Psalm 8, um, that, that he must have written this somehow after he was out looking up into the night sky. Because he says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He says, when I consider uh, the heavens, 
uh, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, what he says here is he said, you know, I, I feel pretty small. I feel pretty small. And when you think about the size of this universe, when you think about those great distances and you think about the number of galaxies and the number of bodies in, in this universe, where we exist, even in our own Milky Way galaxy, we seem pretty insignificant. This little wee thing called the Earth. And then we're, we're so small in the midst, in, in light of how big the Earth is you can feel pretty insignificant. And maybe he felt that way, because he said, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is he. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, he says, what are we as human beings? What, are, what is mankind that you're, you even consider him? What is mankind that you, you know, have this relationship with him? What is mankind? How does he say it? What is mankind that, um, yeah, that you're mindful of him? That's what I said. What is mankind that you're mindful of him? That you even think about him? It's a good question. Because I think he was wrestling with this, yeah, we're pretty small in light of, of, of the moon and the stars that you have set in place. But then he says this. He says, um, you've made them a little lower than the angels. It's kind of like this clicks in, truth kicks in. Because he says, you know, we're pretty small. But he says, you've made them, you've made us human beings, you've made mankind a little bit lower, he says, than the angels or the heavenly beings in some translations. Actually, both of those words are not the correct word that's used there. The word that's translated as angels or heavenly beings in that, in that verse is the word Elohim. And he's really saying, God, you've made us, you've made these human beings just a little lower than, than God himself, just a little less than God himself. That's kind of interesting when he says that. So, so, so truth kind of kicks in. He says, you made a little lower than the angels. He says, you made him ruler. Oh, and he says, you've crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the world, of the wild, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea and all that swim, the paths of the sea. And then he concludes with again, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So what he's really saying is that there's something special, something unique about these human beings in, in, in the midst of this, the, the, the vastness of this universe. It's kind of interesting. And what he's really saying is that, that, that human beings are special. And I think, that's, I think that's what I want to say to you. That's what I want us to see today. And I want to say to you personally that, that you are a special person, that we are, are, are special and we are unique. And I think there's all kinds of testimony of that in the scripture. And so I want to just camp on two or three or four verses that, that tell us that, that, um, that we are unique. Uh, that there's something special about us. Uh, we are the crown of his creation. And so, so let's look at those. Uh, so I want to say actually uh, five things to you, uh, just very quickly. I want you to know this, that you as a, as a person, and this is true of, of every human being in the world, doesn't matter whether you're a believer or not a believer, uh, this is true of you, that you were created by God as a special and a unique person. You are created by God as a special and unique person. One of my favorite Psalms uh, in, in, uh, in the book of Psalms is the 139th Psalm, uh, where the writer talks about just how well God knows us as human beings, how God knows us as individuals. He starts out in verse 1 by saying this, You have searched me, O God, and you know me. You know when I sit, you know when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, just... Just think about this as you're going, as I'm going through this. You know, God knows you. God knows you and he knows me better than we know ourselves. He says, you know what I sit and when I rise. In other words, he knows what we're going to do through the day. Uh, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You know, we don't know what one another's thinking, but God knows every thought that's going through your mind right now. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all of my ways and don't we all have our ways of doing things? Uh, you have them and I have them. Sometimes you can, you, you can tell people who tell who people are just by the way they're walking. If they're off in a distance, and you see that, yeah, I know who that is because they have a particular way of walking, and we all have our ways. He says, um, "Before a word is on my tongue, uh, Lord, you know it completely." <laughs> see, we say a lot through the day, and God already knows all the words that are going to come out of our mouths. He says, "You hem me in and behind." 
you hem me in behind and before, you lay your hand upon me. In other words, you are guiding me. Such knowledge, he says, is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And then he gets into, uh, you know, talking about, you know, how you can't hide from God because God is everywhere. And when you get to verse 13, which is what I want to focus on here, he says, he says, for you, God, you created, he says, my inmost being. Interesting verse. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You created my inmost being, he says. What, what's he talking about there? Well, well, the inmost being is, is, the, is the person. It's the you that dwells in that body that you have. It's that person that, that leaves when the body functions no more. And from our perspective, you die. And you know that as well as I do. When you visit a funeral home to pay respects to a person who has passed away and they're laying there in the, in the casket in the funeral home and you're walking by, the body is there, but they're not. That person that you, that you used to relate to and, and talk to, that person isn't there. They are gone. Well, that's the, that's the you. That's the, the you that was created within me when, when it says here, for you created my inmost being. My inmost being. That's the you. You knit me together in my mother's womb. That gives us a clue as to how God did that. I, I don't know how he did it, but, but it says here, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Somehow, I think what that's saying is that at the point of conception, God acted. God did something unique. Um, using characteristics of your mother and your father in, the, in that union that was there. And, and at the point of conception in your mother's womb, God acted, and when he acted, he created that unique person called you. See, you, friends, you are, are, are more. You and I, we are more. As human beings, we are more than just you know, the byproduct of some biological function. God had a hand in making us who we are. God had a direct hand in making us who we are. That's what's being said there. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And so what... One of the implications of that is this, that, that, that you are unique in the sense that there's no other person just like you in the whole wide world. Every person of the billions and billions of people in, uh, living on this earth, every person is unique. There are no two people who are exactly the same. Even when you have identical twins, you know as well as I do that, that they are two entirely different persons. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully, and I would put in there, uniquely made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So I just say that to you. We need to affirm that. We need to, to, to realize that, that, that we were created as a special and unique people. There, there's no one else in the world like you and me. And of course, that's true of us as human beings because we were made in the image of God. That's, that makes us unique as well in the whole universe. That's the teaching of Scripture. So know that today. Know that, that you were created as a special and unique person. The second uh, uh, verse I want to look at, or the second thing I want to say to you, is not only were you created as a special and unique person, but as a human being, and, and again, this applies to every person in the whole wide world, whether a believer or not. You, every human being, is the special object of God's love. That's how unique you are. The special object in all of the universe the special object of God's love. And we see that, for example, in, in, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, a very familiar verse, for God so loved the world. And you can put your name in there. For God so loved you. God so loved me. God so loved Malcolm. God so loved you. Put your name in there. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting love. For God so loved the world. Somehow we've got to get a hold of that with regard to God and God's love for us. The message I preached last Sunday on, 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 on God seeking, or Jesus rather, coming to seek and to save the lost. I talked about that, about, about you know, we are sinners in the hands not of an angry God, but we're sinners in the hands of a loving God. For God so loved us, for God so loved the world. And we need to get a hold of that. We need to, to see that. That needs to sink deeply into our, not just our minds, but into our hearts of how loved we are. Because I think sometimes we get the opposite idea. Even, even in church, we get the opposite idea. Um, and, and, you know, that we're not worthy of it and that we are, we are worms and, and that kind of thing. And God kind of reluctantly saves us. But no, God loves us. God loves us. Then you'll run into these people. Uh, 
maybe you've run into them, who if you're talking to them about the Lord or, or, or something like that, you'll get this argument sometimes that the person is saying, well, you know, I can't really believe in a God who would send somebody to a place called hell in their understanding of hell. And, you know, if somebody says that to you, you want to say to them, well, God doesn't do that. God doesn't send anybody to hell. And we know that from John chapter 3 and verse 16 and verse 17 and verse 18. You know, we, we focus on 16, but, but 17 and 18 are, are important verses as well because it goes on to say that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. And then it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then it says, he who believes is not condemned, but he who believes not is condemned already. Why? Because he hasn't believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. God doesn't send anybody to hell. Friends, if at the end of my life I end up in that place called hell, it's not because God has sent me there. It's because I haven't accepted his way out. I haven't accepted his love which says to me, I've come to rescue you. Give your life to me. If I end up in hell, it's because I didn't accept the gift of forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. And it's it's really my fault because God loves me. God loves me. He doesn't want me to end up there. He looked down on us and saw that because of our sin, we were bound for that kind of a place. He said, I'm going to rescue them. And he sent Jesus. And Jesus came to save us. And if I reject that gift, if I don't receive that gift, I can't blame God for where I end up at the end of my life. God loves us. And how does God love us? Well, I heard Lewis Smead say this one time, and it really, it really spoke to me. He said, God loves us, first of all, in spite of who we are. Because the reality is we are sinners. The reality is we are running away from God. But in spite of that, God loves us. He loves us in spite of who we are. He loves us just as we are, he said. In other words, I don't have to become something other than what I am for God to love me. Even in my worst moments, I don't have to become, I don't have to be someone different in order to, to, to be loved by God. God loves me. And then he says this, God not only loves us in spite of who we are, and God not only loves us as we are, but he said God loves us because of who we are. And he was getting at the fact that we are made in the image of God. God loves us because we're worth that love as the bearers of his image. We are worthy of that love, even though we don't deserve it because of our sin. We're the special objects of God's love. Can you know that this morning? Thirdly, the third thing I want to say to you about how unique and special you are is this, that and this, this now applies, by the way, to, to those who are in Christ, okay? Who have received that gift, received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They are living in that eternal kind of life, that kingdom life, and walking with Jesus. Um, you, each one of us who are doing that, we have a special relationship with that God of all creation that, that believers don't have, that non-believers rather don't have. We have a special relationship with the God of all creation. Let me just look at um, Romans chapter 8 and, um, and, and verse 14. Um, and following where it says this, Paul's talking about life through the Holy Spirit. And he says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. That's a clue right there. We're the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you might live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received when you believed... Uh, brought about your adoption to sonship or into the family kind of thing. And it's by him, by that, that, that Savior, by Jesus, that we cry this word, that we cry, Abba, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the, we, that we are the children of God. There's that word, Abba, which is really talking about intimacy with this God of all creation. Because Abba is a term that, would be translated for a small child, it would be daddy, speaking to the father. Uh, for an adult, it would be like me saying to my father, calling him dad. It's that, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's an intimate kind of, of a personal relationship. You, you can imagine. You remember when Jesus uh, was teaching his disciples one day, when they asked him to teach them to pray, and he taught them by using what we today call the Lord's Prayer. And how did that start out? So, so Jesus said this, he said, well, you know, when... When you pray, start this, pray this way. Our Abba. Our Abba. 
in our culture today, we are not fully aware of how revolutionary that kind of thing was for him to be talking and telling them that when you talk to this God, when you talk to this Yahweh in this culture where where the, the name of God is so revered and God is so revered that, that you, you can't come near him, only the priest could go in to the Holy of Holies, for example. You, you weren't even allowed to pronounce the, the full name of Yahweh. You had to take the vowels out and, and, uh, and because, you know, you can't say the full name of God because you might profane his name. So, so it's in that kind of a culture where there was this great fear of, of even naming God. That, that, that Jesus says now, well, when you talk to him, you say Abba, you say Father, Dad to him. It's, that's that term of intimacy. So I, I'm sure the disciples just kind of looked and said, what, excuse me, what did you say? Because it was so revolutionary. But it was getting at the new relationship we can have with God through Jesus Christ, an intimate relationship. We can go directly into the throne of grace. Directly. Dad. Respectfully. But Dad. See, there's only two people in the whole wide world who can call me dad. And that's my son, Ben, and my daughter, Sarah. And why? Because they're my children. And they have a special and unique relationship with me, their dad, that nobody else in the world has. That's the kind of thing that's being gotten at here. So know that today. You, as a believer, you have a special relationship with the God of all creation wherein you can... Call him Abba, Father, Dad. Number four, again, for you as a believer, for me as a believer, you have been given, and we have been given, special and unique gifts by the Holy Spirit. Special and unique gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is, of course, um, Paul's teaching, or a significant part of Paul's teaching on spiritual gifts. And he's using the analogy of the body, of course, and how we're all parts of the body. And that's referring to, again, different gifts that we have. And, and, and here's the verse I want to read, verse 18. And I read this one because, you know, sometimes when we talk about spiritual gifts and we relate that to ourselves, we're not too kind on ourselves or kind with ourselves. We will say, yeah, there are people who have gifts, but that's that person. You have gifts. You obviously have gifts. You have gifts, but then there's me. And we're quite hesitant to acknowledge or affirm that, yeah, God has given me gifts too. But listen to this. Verse 8, this context of talking about the body and, and the, the parts of the body being representing the different gifts. He says this. He says, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, and then he says this, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Did you hear that? God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. He's placed them in the body. Now, when he says every one of them, who does that exclude among believers? No one. You're in. Just so you know, you're in. You have special and unique gifts that God has given to you. And you need to affirm that. You need to, to be able to, to um, I'm going to say, hold your head high uh, you need to affirm, be able to affirm gifts in other people and, and not compare, but affirm the gifts that you have and just be focusing on using those gifts and use them because God has given them to you and, and use them with a sense of, of being a part of the whole. You've got them. You've got them. You have special and unique gifts. I remember uh, when I was growing up, I've told this story before, but I remember Bicycles. Bicycles were a big thing for us boys growing up in the community. Uh, not many of us had good bicycles. We just, most all of us in the community had hand-me-downs. We only had one in our home, and it was a girl's bike. My sister had it, and then I got it after that, and so away you'd go with the guys. And I, I had been to my aunt and uncle's one, one time. They lived in the city here in St. John, and had um, seen in their basement uh, this bicycle that I... I, I, I just fell in love with. It was a, a, a boy's bike. It was a, it was a, a three-speed bicycle. It had handbrakes on it. Nobody in our community had one of those. It was candy apple red. It had, you know, a, a mouse trap parcel carrier on the back. It had, it had the streamers coming out of the, the handle. It had mirrors on it. It had a bell on it. It had a light that would, that you could drive at night kind of thing and the generator down on the, on the wheel type thing. It had these reflectors in the spokes. It had mud flaps on the, on the, uh, 
on the uh, fenders, on the end of the fenders, kind of like it was the it was the prettiest bike I had ever seen, and I wanted the thing. Make a long story short, um, uh, I had saved up some money. My aunt and uncle said I could have it, but I had to save up money for it. There was a cost for it, and so I got it. I remember the day it came home. I remember the day I got it, and the day I got it, there was not one of the guys in the community that was more proud to be out on the road with their bicycle than me. At just up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Just riding it with, hey, look what I have. Now, that's human pride, okay? But my point is this. Uh, no one else in the, in, in the community had a bike just like that. I had a unique kind of thing. And so I could, I could drive with my head held high, not on this clunkety old thing. And, and, and I think, you know, in terms of spiritual gifts, let's put humility in there. You can walk around, you can serve, you can, you, you can live your life for the Lord with your head held high humbly recognizing that you have a special and unique gift to offer to the body. And you don't have to take a back seat to anyone. I want to encourage you in that. I say humbly. My bicycle thing, that was with pride, okay? But to humbly accept that you have something that nobody else has. So I encourage you in that. That's another way in which you are special and which you are unique. You have been given special gifts. And then the final thing I want to say is this. And you know this as well as I do. And that's the fact that, that uh, there, there is a special place prepared for you and me when we're done with this life. And that's from John chapter 14, where Jesus was dealing with you know the disciples who were troubled because he was going to go away. And he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare, this word isn't in there, but I'm going to put it there, that I go to prepare a special place for you. A special place for you. The only point I want to make here is this, that, 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 you know, that God has you covered. And God, all through your life, says to you, you're special and unique. You were created by him as a special and unique person. There's nobody else like you in the whole wide world. You were the special object as a human being made in the image of God. You were the special object of, of, of God's love and that he came to rescue you. You have special a special relationship. Because of that, you have a special relationship with the God of all creation wherein you can call him Abba, Father. In Jesus Christ, you have been given special and unique gifts that nobody else has, just like you. And then when you're done with this life, you have a special place prepared for you a special place for special people who are special because of Jesus. And I want you to affirm that. I want you to be encouraged by these words. Because in this world today, there's a whole lot of philosophy out there, a whole lot of people who would say that human beings are no nothing special. It's nothing unique. That we've evolved from this or from that. And there's nothing unique about us. But there is. And it's a gift. And we need to give thanks to God for that. So when you look in the mirror tomorrow morning when you get up, you need to say, good job, God. Thank you. Let me pray. Father, we are thankful again for your great love for us. And we thank you that in all of this created order, we human beings are unique. According to your word, we are unique. We don't know all things. But Lord, we know you through your coming to us and revealing yourself to us, showing us not just who you are, but who we are. And so, Father, help us to be encouraged on a daily basis by knowing that we were created by you in our mother's wombs, that we were loved by you infinitely, that we can have a special relationship with you, God, through Jesus, wherein we can call you our Father, that we've been given special gifts, Lord, to serve you in this world. Special and unique gifts. And the gracious Father, just to be thankful that you have a special place prepared for us when we leave this world and this life here. Lord, cement those things and seal those things in our hearts and in our minds. Give us joy because of them. And may you be glorified in our lives as we recognize these things and live according to them. 
For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So next week, hope to see you here uh, at the church. And remember, just a reminder that if you're going to come, you need to call or email the church and register for that service. So God bless you this week uh, as you serve him. And may you stay safe. And hopefully we will see you on this Sunday. God bless you. Bye.